The first step is cleaning the cotton. Before cording, uh, the seeds have to be taken out of the brown cotton because these quarters will not remove the cotton seeds. And a brown cotton bowl, when you're in the field picking it, generally has four or five little sections like this. Uh, brown cotton is an inferior cotton. It's a short staple, and it has many, many cotton seeds. So what you're going to do, what they had to do before cotton gins, when they first arrived here in Louisiana, they had to uh, clean it by hand. So you would take one little section, turn it over, because it's easier to clean it from the bottom side, because the seeds are pointing outward. And if you look at this, you can see this slick Acadian cotton seed, and it's got a pointed end to it. So uh, it just kind of tears your hands after a while. But you're going to go down this little um, edge here and this section until you get all of these little cotton seeds out. The first step into cording is cleaning, which I've just done. Then we have to make what I'm going to show you is it's called a rollag. But before you can do this, you have to straighten the fibers and you have to stretch the fibers because there's no length to brown cotton. So what I'm going to do, these quarters have a wooden paddle and they have little tiny metal teeth. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load my cotton quarters with brown cotton. And of course, you can do as many roll lags as you'd like. Um, just be a little careful if you're going to try this, that you keep your fingers away from these little metal teeth up at the top. And I try not to bring my cotton over the edge. I try to stay within the edge. And I'm just going back and forth, back and forth, drawing out, stretching the fibers, and smoothing out the brown cotton. At this point, I think that I've probably worked it enough. I'll do it one more time, pick it up, transfer it, and I'm going to put a small amount. And when I put that last amount of cotton on this card, I don't go beyond the halfway mark. I generally try to stay underneath the halfway mark because I'm going to pick it up with this side. And I'm going to go back and work this side later. So I'm ready to take this off right here. And I'm going to lay it in again, rock it. And then I'm going to remove it and roll it. And I now have a roll egg. I will go back and work this side and make another roll egg with what's left on my carter. Again, um, over time, you kind of learn that if you're going to work on a certain piece, for instance, uh, let's say you wanted to make a nice long runner. I, I think it's best if you sit down and cord just a whole basket full of roll lags so that your roll lags are all the same and when you get to your spinning wheel, you can just go nonstop and, and be sure that you have the same size thread. Okay, this side has been worked. I'm going to, I think it's smooth enough. I'm going to remove it. And we're going to have the second row leg. And here it is. I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit first about spinning and my experience with spinning brown cotton, which I'm going to do. Uh, again, brown cotton is a short fiber. It's a little hard to work with, and generally spinners are not real anxious to work with it. But I have found that looking at the brown cotton blankets that all of the Acadian women made, and some are over 100 years old, 
Uh, the Acadians had a saying about brown cotton, ya pod be o cotonade. There's no end to the cotonade, to the brown cotton fabric. Once you give that short staple enough twist, it's going to hold together. But a problem may be, especially in your blankets, I've documented brown cotton blankets. If you over twist the brown cotton, you're not going to get a soft blanket. So you have to be sure that you give this brown cotton roll lag enough twist to hold together, but not be so tight that you're going to have a rigid textile. This is one of the pieces that I've made with the size cotton that you're going to see me spinning. And uh, some people look at the cotton that I'm spinning and say, oh my, that's awfully large. It's heavy cotton. But it really isn't. It's kind of considered fine cotton spinning because when I get to the loom and I beat in that cotton, it looks like this. I've done this, uh, I've hand spun it, hand woven, and I've washed it in the washing machine and I've dried it. So it did shrink because it's cotton, but it still is nice and soft. And it feels like a cotton shirt that you would be wearing. And all of these pieces are done with that same size cotton that I'm about to show you. What I'm going to do, the Acadians adapted their wheels because when they got here, they had a flyer attachment for their wool. And they would sit on their chair and the wool would go through this opening. But when they found the brown cotton and wanted to do the blankets, they had their husbands put a spike on their wheels. And of course, today I can buy a spike through the Ashford company that makes this wheel. Uh, and they would do the heavy cotton that they didn't have to worry about going through the opening. If I was spinning cotton for a blanket, it would be almost the size of my little finger. So this is actually considered fine cotton spinning. And what I'm going to do is, everything happens right on this tip. I'm going to hold it. I'm not going to do anything, but let it touch. You, I'll do it very slow. See, it's just barely touching. And at this point, all of the work's done with my left hand. So I have to draw it out the size that I want. If I draw it without turning the wheel, it's going to break. So I have to give it a little spin and I have to draw it out. At this point, I know that I want it to be this size, but it's not going to hold together. So what I have to do is stop it here and I have to let the cotton twist onto itself. And then I can feel it. After a while, you get a feel for it. You can feel it twisting. And at this point, I've got nice strong thread that I can use. And it's not, hopefully not over twisted. If it is over twisted, I'll just let it go. See how this is maybe a little over twisted, but not that bad. So I'll stop the wheel, reverse it, I'll store it, and I'll draw out another length and set the twist. And of course, I don't want to give it too much twist. And again, when I add another row lag, I'm doing absolutely nothing but just letting it touch, pull it out, and set the twist. And you would do this until you have one of these little paper quills uh, filled with yarn, and then you'd be ready to go to your loom. But what I like to do is if I'm working on um, a table runner, um, don't always do it that way, but I think it's best if you sit and spin several of these so that you know they're, they're rather consistent. Because you, you kind of get a feel for it. 
And of course, I still have trash that falls out. That's why I keep this in my lap when I'm working. And if you should break the thread, I'll do it. It's not a problem. This is one continuous piece. And twist, draw it out. I'm going to show you uh, a technique that uh, I don't think many people, many Acadians use. But what I'm going to do is, same method, I only have one, you know, thread here, yarn to start with. But I'm going to let them touch. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to draw it out together. See, I've got a white and a brown. And draw it to the size that I want. Set the twist. And I've got a duble thread. Before I go any further, let me show you what it looks like. It's this kind of variegated pattern. It's very uneven, but I like it. I think it's kind of neat. If you ply your thread, which is what most spinners do, um, you get this even barbershop pull effect. But I kind of like the uneven, you know, uh, pattern that you get with this because you really don't know what you're going to get. Um, try as you might. I don't think it's ever going to be that even. So again, I'm going to store it and I'm going to draw out more. Sometimes you get more brown. Sometimes you get more white. And we have a little problem here. Uh, the brown cotton is a little shorter than the white cotton. The white cotton's longer. It's a longer fiber, easier to um, spin. So what's going to happen usually is that I'm letting in a little more white because I know I'm getting towards the end. But you're going to end with less brown and more white because, again, the white cotton is a longer fiber. That's not a problem because I can use it later on. So I'm going to do another one. So you can see the effect again. And again, when I'm joining it, it matters not as long as they're touching and I'm twisting and I'm pulling and turning the wheel a little. Now it's holding on. I want to give it some strength. I'm going to let it twist all the way up. And I've got some nice duble thread. And of course, again, if it breaks, I'm just going to attach it. I've, I've seen many blankets um, that have duble, and for some reason, uh, they have always, I think I know the reason, I think uh, Colosti is the only one who did this, and Gladys. Um, the blankets are the items, the textiles, have been made by somebody in the LeBlanc family. So I kind of think it's a tradition that the LeBlanc family came up with. And I'm really, really pleased to uh, say that my apprentice, Austin Clark, and after he did the apprenticeship with me, and I told him about the Duble, well, Austin, of course, wants to do exactly what the LeBlanc family does. And it really makes me feel good because doing me doing the apprenticeship 30 somewhat years ago, um, I'm able to know that this tradition is in actually safe hands with Austin because Austin does everything exactly, exactly the way the LeBlanc family did. And he enjoys doing the Duble. And what you're going to see at the loom when uh, we get to the loom Austin is going to work the loom today um, because he has worked on it. He set it up for the exhibit, and um, he's going to demonstrate weaving.
this loom uh, is um, an Acadian loom. It is um, a, a typical design of the 1800s. Uh, sometimes it's called a barn frame loom um, because if you look at the construction methods, it looks uh, similar to how you would put up a barn. Uh, also, sometimes it's called a four post loom. You know, there's four posts like a bed uh, and um, there's a, a bed in the homestead here in the exhibit uh, and you'll see uh, similar construction methods. Something uh, interesting about this loom, uh, it was often, uh, looms were often shared in a family. And so um, you would do all of your carding and your spinning and then you'd be ready to do your weaving. So uh, one person would have the loom, they would do all their weaving, they would take it apart, give it to the next family member. So uh, when you went to put it back together, you'll see uh, there are Roman numerals that sort of tell you which parts go where. Um, so that's interesting. Um, these looms were mostly um, made of cypress or ash, whatever they could get their hands on. Um, Acadian looms uh, in particular are uh, just two harnesses. Um, so that means uh, it's just plain weave. Uh, some, sometimes uh, you have more elaborate uh, designs, um, but not here, just over, under, over, under. This is the harness. And so these strings um, that are on the harness, they pull the threads up and down depending on which foot pedal I press. Yeah? So then when I, um, so when I do that, there's a space created here, and this is called the shed. So when I throw, so this is the warp on the loom, and then back and forth is the weft. So when I throw uh, the weft, It's going through that shed, and then I use the reed. This is, uh, the reed is in the beater, so then I just sort of squish it into place. And then I change my foot, and then I throw the bobbin back through, catch it, make sure everything's good, and I squish that into place. Then I change my foot as I was moving it back, and then I throw it through again. The, the reed here uh, on this loom is original, and it's made of river cane um, and, or, or bamboo. And so uh, you'll see um, that somebody had to take river cane, split it, tie it in place, and make sure it was even. So uh, you'll see I have this uh, stretcher here on the loom, and that keeps, uh, that really protects the reed uh, because your fabric that's woven, it has a, a tendency to want to draw in, and because the, the reed is so valuable, we really want to protect that. So um, you might have, uh, in summer camp, done, um, you know, woven a pot holder or something, you know, over, under, over, under. Well, to speed that up, I have treadles here, and, um, and when I press one, it creates a shed, and it moves every other thread up, so I can throw through, and then I can beat that in, and then I can change it and do the next one. Oftentimes, uh, Acadian weavers would put on warps um, for several blankets, and it was not uncommon for them to wind a warp that was 60, 80, 100 yards. You know, really, you know, make it count, be efficient. Weaving is a really um, involved process. Um, this warp is about 500 threads uh, across, and every warp thread has to go through a heddle and then through the reed before it's finally tied here, before you're ready to weave. So there are many hours that go into um, to preparing the loom uh, for weaving, and that's you know not taking into account all of the spinning that you had to do before that.